Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> Hello, Donald. It's, it's really, really great to be here. Um, this is where my uh, legal career began with my law partner, Donald Graham. And it's where my political career began. You know, uh, in 1974, which is when I came here, Patrick uh, Leahy was running for the US Senate. And uh, I was, um, Donald and I were public defenders here in White River Junction. And I volunteered on Patrick's first campaign. <laughs> and we met him, uh, I met Patrick and Marcel uh, at, the, at, at the Coolidge Hotel. And I couldn't believe it because Marcel was uh, getting all set to move to Washington. Uh, and at that point, uh, it was just before the headline came out that the Leahy campaign is doomed because it was a poll that came out. Uh, and I was a volunteer for Patrick here in uh, Windsor County. And uh, of course, he went on to this extraordinary career serving us and serving the nation for 48 years. Uh, and then a week ago on Tuesday, Patrick walked me down the aisle to take the oath of office to succeed him in the Senate. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, was real, it, was real, it was very special. And obviously, nobody's going to uh, be able to replace Patrick. But you know, we've got a tradition here in this state that is really quite extraordinary of public service. Uh, and my hope is that I'm going to be able to continue uh, to meet that standard that Patrick uh, was so wonderful at. Uh, We'll get to the questions right away, but let me just step back a little bit and, and, and put it in a context to where we are. Because uh, so much of the stuff that's happening, you know, we saw what happened in the House with those 15 votes uh, and the Speaker, now Speaker McCarthy, essentially having to capitulate to very far right, radical right folks uh, to change rules in the House is, is going to make things much more difficult for us. Uh, so you get caught up in the news of the day, and it can be somewhat discouraging. But you know, it's extraordinary what has happened in these past two years, if you step back and take a look. You know, January 6th, two years ago, you know, I was in the building when it got attacked. And that came within an eyelash of literally overturning a democratic election. And as sad as it was and as scary as it was when I was in that chamber and the mob was uh, breaking down the door and when the shot was fired, it was even worse at 3 in the morning when we came back and 147 of my colleagues voted against certifying Joe Biden as the President of the United States. And what that indicated was that we were in for the battle of our democracy to preserve it. That was very, very serious. And as we saw with the January 6th Commission, it was concerted, it was deliberate. Uh, it was planned, it was financed, and at the center of everything was Donald Trump. And we then had two years to try to put uh, the House back together. In this past election, if I get excited about anything in the outcome of the election, and it's not just that the Senate stayed Democratic, and it's not just that the House Democrats held on, not quite to a majority, but not that 60 or 70 vote, over uh, a reversal that people feared, there was a decision that America made to repudiate the election deniers. That is really the best part of what this last election was about. Because the democracy that we have is the tool we need to address the challenges that we face, like climate change, like income inequality, like lack of access to health care, like the high cost of prescription drugs, you name it. If we don't have a democracy to be the tool that we can use to try to address those problems, it's going to be really, really, really bad. So I'm really excited about the fact that the American people made what I think is a major decision, and we can build on that. And obviously, you know, I've had the chance to serve uh, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the House of Representatives for 16 years. Uh, the things I've cared about are no different now that I'm moving and am in the Senate. And it'll be standing up for democracy. It'll be fighting 
on climate change. It will be fighting on all these affordability challenges that everyday Americans have. Folks who are trying to work and they can't afford child care, the cost of housing that's getting so brutal, not just in Vermont but all around the country, uh, trying to deal uh, with the challenges of immigration. All of that I have the opportunity to work on on behalf of Vermonters and behalf of the country. And I just got to tell you on a personal level, it's so wonderful to be here in White River uh, where I started, where Donald and I played on a softball team, <laughs> where I practice law, uh, and where uh, uh, all of us are gathered together again. So let me stop there and open it up uh, for questions and comments. But it is really good to be back home in downtown White River Junction. Any questions? Come on up to, I, do we have to come up to the microphone? No, I can feed. I'll bring it, yeah. Turn the lights up. Lights up? We got a request for lights up, yeah. All right, what else can we do? We, we got stage, stage direction advice. Yeah. Uh, yes, my name is Kim Aiken. I'm from Windsor. And uh, you mentioned the border. And I'm just curious, what is being done about the border crisis? Well, let me put this. Let, let's talk about this. Number one, it's a serious problem. Okay, 2.5 million people showed up uh, trying to come into the United States for all different kinds of reasons. So it is a serious issue. There's a, there's a you here and here are the issues that I think are have to be addressed. One is how do we deal with that, and what the president is doing is trying to increase not only enforcement but also the asylum process that just isn't going to be able to accommodate 2.5 million people. What's one of the causes? A major cause is the collapse of governments in Nicaragua, in Cuba, uh, in Haiti, in Venezuela where people are so desperate that they're actually making this hike across the Darien Gap down in, 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 down in, in Panama. So those challenges, root cause challenges, have to be part of how we address that. Second, we've got to have more legal immigration. We have not had an effort for immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform that includes border security, but also a legal pathway to citizenship for folks who are here, legal immigration to help us with our workforce challenges, legal immigration for people who are getting PhDs in this country and can stay and want to stay. So my view, it's got to be a comprehensive approach that includes the asylum process and procedures that work. Uh, President Biden is doing that. It's also got to include a legal pathway to citizenship, and it's got to include more legal immigration to help us in our country. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't President Trump seek to create legal immigration? You know, President Trump politicized the issue. When we had an opportunity in 2014 to vote on a comprehensive immigration bill, the Senate passed one. People like John McCain and Patrick Leahy voted for it. We were not given the opportunity to vote on it in the House. Mr. Boehner did not bring it up. And I got to tell you my view, President Trump politicized the issue. He did not look for a solution. It was a political issue that he used to, to stoke division and not try to solve the problem. And I don't know if you remember this, but I was appalled by this. We started a policy where when families showed up, and it might be a single woman with two kids, or a couple with a couple of kids, the policy of the United States government was to take those kids from their parents and separate them. That was outrageous. And it was intended to be punitive and to keep people from coming. That's not a policy I can support, and that was the, that was the Trump policy. So you, so you think that it's better now? You know, first of all, let's, say, let's, let's stop a minute. I think that policy is outrageous, okay? Better or worse, we can't be doing that, separating parents from kids. And by the way, some of those kids have still not been reconnected to their parents. That's not acceptable. What's happening right now is these collapsed governments 
a lot of violence, a lot of climate change degradation, so people can't even eke out a, a, a minimal income, is driving people to come up here. So we've got to deal with that because it's not as though we can have an open border, which appears to be your concern, and I share that. No, I think that the board, I think President Biden wants all these people to come up here so they'll vote Democrat. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm on, okay. <clears throat> uh, Senator, um, I, I'm no, I know you're probably aware of the fact that under the Kennedy administration, uh, an initiative was established called Partners of the Americas. Right. And uh, Vermont uh, <clears throat> became uh, partners with Honduras. And I know that both you and, uh, and uh, Senator Leahy have done much to, uh, uh, to help in Central America. Um, <clears throat> the issue that I'm most concerned about is, uh, is uh, uh, CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, and also uh, NAFTA, which was the North American Free Trade Agreement. And those agreements, uh, in my view, totally undermine the rural economy of these poor Central American countries. It's a total uh, imbalance. And, uh, and I think as a consequence, uh, people, uh, because they have no alternative, are streaming to this, to this country. And so I, I hope that... Uh, uh, some of your efforts will be devoted to looking into and perhaps uh, reconsidering and rebalancing uh, this country's policies uh, that uh, are implemented through CAFTA and NAFTA. Well, two things. Dean, first of all, thank you for the incredible work you've done in Honduras. And I see my former colleague uh, in the State House, Anne. Uh, right next to you. Uh, for, you're right, okay? If, when you have people coming here and they've literally up there, they picked their kids up and said, we're leaving Guatemala, we're leaving Honduras, and we're walking to El Paso. And that's literally what they do. And they have to pass through a lot of violent territory where people are trying to exploit them, attack them, steal from them, assault them. That's desperation. And people want to stay where they live, by and large, but they've got to have a chance to, they've got to have some hope that they can pay their bills uh, and live in some safety. So anything we can do that helps deal with those root causes, including trade agreements, makes sense to do. So thank you. Hi, my name is Fred Lerner. My question is this. What do you think can be done to try to get the Democrats and the Republicans and the independents in the Congress to work together to accomplish something at least? You know, <laughs> uh, Fred, that's the heart of the challenge we face in this country, OK? And here's how I do it. This is how I try to do it, and I did it when I worked with Anna in the State House. The challenges we face, I'll just name a bunch of them. Real lack of broadband, high cost of housing, high cost of prescription drugs. You can be in a red district that voted big for Trump, or you can be in a blue district that voted big for, say, Patrick Leahy. The folks who live in those districts are afflicted by the same challenge. We all need broadband. And I worked hard on broadband while I was in Congress and created the Rural Broadband Caucus. As a, as a Vermont member of Congress, I'm a delegation of one. I was oftentimes in the minority. And when I would approach my Republican colleagues, I didn't indict them because they voted for Trump and I voted for Biden, let's say. I asked them, how's your broadband? We got in a conversation because their broadband was lousy. You know, we're having this debate about 5G. I say, we've got a lot of places in Vermont that's no G. So you start working on what is a challenge 
for the people they represent and the people I represent. And that's how I had the opportunity to be really successful ultimately on broadband. The same thing with telehealth. You know how important telehealth is, especially in rural America? I, we created the telehealth conference. And I work with lots and lots of Republicans on that. So that's the approach that I try to take. And it's something we learn at town meeting. So thank you for that question. And you're absolutely right. And I think everybody wants us to get things done. And in fact, I think in this last election, what helped is Congress started passing legislation in those last several months that really made a difference. Effectiveness. Hi, my name is Mary Elizabeth Gay, and I am a special um, spec for United States Army. And, you know, there is one thing that we really need to address and have a conversation about um, is the homelessness in Vermont. Um, I see that more of the homeless people that are in Vermont are United States soldiers and um, you know we're, we're putting them in tents we're putting them in in um, anywhere where we, they can't be seen or, or addressed right there's there's buildings here in Hartford Vermont that could be used as housing for for homeless people and you know it's not that I didn't try to find the owner of one building and start that project. It didn't turn out. Um, but what are we going to do for our vets, you know? And it's getting worse because some benefits, according to vets, are getting cut, um, like the homeless payment, the mm -hmm. uh, HUD thing. Um, so, you know, do we need to have more and more of us homeless? To really, to really um, make an acknowledgement of it, because we need to know, we need to acknowledge it now. Well, I want to thank you uh, for that really eloquent and heartfelt statement on behalf of our vets. And that's an area where there's been generally very strong bipartisan support. But some of the things that have happened to vets are out, absolutely outrageous. Suicide rate is higher among vets than the general population. It's really tough when I talk to vets. They're over there in Iraq or they're in Afghanistan. They've got the unit. They fight for one another. And then suddenly they're back home. And nobody even knows they were gone. No one knows what they were doing. They don't get that support that they had in that unit. And as tough as it was, I've had many vets tell me they felt closer and had more friendships than they did when they came home and people ignored them. And then one thing that we worked on, in addition to homelessness, do you know how many of our vets got cancer as a result of having to be stationed next to these so-called burn pits that were like three or four football fields wide and uh, were uh, burning toxic stuff and they were breathing those fumes? And when they got these illnesses, cancer-related illnesses, the VA said, no treatment for you. You can't quote, prove that you got that in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we had a vet right up here, at the Hartford Fire Department, who died and worked hard with John Stewart. His wife got involved and two widows up in the Chittenden County area who I work with. And we introduced legislation and ultimately got the PACT Act passed that is going to guarantee that anyone who has one of these respiratory illnesses and served in the vicinity in Iraq or Afghanistan is going to have access to full health care benefits. So homelessness is a part of it. But bottom line here, and you speak very well about this, if we're asking a man or a woman to go to war, they do their duty. The cost of the war has to include, has to include the cost of caring for the warrior. So thank you. The budget cuts up top that are, are causing veterans to fall through the cracks. Yeah, there, there haven't been bu budget cuts in the VA. Okay, there may not, I'm quite willing to talk to you about how we can spend the money better or do we need more, but there, haven't, there have not been cuts. 
Yeah, and I got to tell you, the Republicans and Democrats are on the same page on that, by and large. Uh, and that's an area of bipartisan cooperation, by and large. But thank you for speaking up on behalf of our vet veterans. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator, thank you. If I can turn quickly to immigration and refugees. My name is Brian Dalton with Bennington County Open Arms. I'm here with Mustafa and Nemot, who work our staff of the ECDC, the Ethiopian Community Development Council that's in Brattleboro. And um, we've been having a lot of success settling families in southern Vermont. I will briefly ask your help going forward with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service and U.S. State Department's uh, visa process, which I used to work. Um, the cases are taking so long, as you're, uh, you and your office are well aware, and your office and uh, Senator Lee's office and Sanders have all been helping the individual cases. Um, because the Afghan Adjustment Act didn't make it uh, through the last session of Congress, uh, we'll need to quickly find another solution because humanitarian parole for right. these people who've uh, been here now in Vermont for a year will expire in the summer. And many of them either need to uh, they, they qualify for asylum or the special immigrant visas because of their uh, long service with the U.S. military or the diplomatic service. And um, many of their, their ability to set down their roots and get their uh, work lives going and their education going is being hampered by not having the paperwork. They're here, right. they're ready, they're willing, they're able. Um, uh, these gentlemen are working with them every day, but they have uh, legitimately employers look at their documentation and it doesn't look like fully authorized to, to work here fully legally here, and they don't know what they're looking at. Right. Um, so it's adding to the trauma of, that they've already been through. So, sorry, I said I'd be sure, but um, looking forward to working with your office to get USCIS and State Department better staffed in these functions to um, make sure that our new Afghan neighbors can get their lives going. Thank you. Um. Well, th um, thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, and the folks who are with you are from? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Welcome. <laughs> and thank you. And I just want to acknowledge something. I mean, the folks, you and others, we're doing things like interpreting for our soldiers. You are saving their lives. We can't abandon you. You didn't abandon us. And we have to have a system where you get a yes or no, you get an answer promptly. And you're not left in limbo. And I want to tell you, I'm apprehensive about this. Because we're now not in Afghanistan, but a lot of folks who helped us and to whom I believe we continue to have an obligation are. And the folks, Afghans, who helped us and are here, are entitled to a quick turnaround on your paperwork so you can get your lives going. I mean, I'm just going to ask everybody here, could you imagine what it would be like if things started falling apart right around here, and you'd been helping, and you're told, hey, in 22 hours, you've got to be at the airport, and we're <coughs> flying to a country you've never been to. You don't." In many cases, speak the language. You don't have a job. You know, that's what's happening, and that's tough. So we've got to try to ease the path as much as possible. And I just want to f finish where I started, and then it's to express my gratitude uh, to you. I apologize for not uh, interjecting the other important issue is family reunification. Right. Almost every family here uh, got separated in that right. uh, quick evacuation process from their children, right. from their uh, spouses. And the family reunification humanitarian process is also um, quite backlogged. Families have been separated for now years and year and a half. Right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Senator. My name is Rocket. Yep. Hi, Rocket. Uh, Hartford How are Select you? One. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you for coming to our town again. Uh, one of the most important roles of the uh, position you're in now, and I think one of the things that Senator Leahy excelled in, was bringing federal money home to Vermont. And a lot of that is obviously contingent on seniority, 
and positioning. So being new in that office, I'm curious how you're um, approaching that and how we as Vermonters might expect things to change at home for us, if at all. Uh, well, there's two, th there's two things, Rocket. One is, uh, Patrick was unique. He was the chair of the Appropriations Committee. That's not a bad job to have for Vermont, OK? <laughs> if you're not chair of the Appropriations Committee, then it's not all about seniority. I mean, having that position is really unique. Um, and uh, Patrick used to tell a funny story uh, with his colleagues who, when they were trying to get money, uh, Patrick would say, well, we all do it alphabetically. Uh, but apparently, V became before A <laughs> when it came to the states. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not chair and won't be chair of the Appropriations Committee. And uh, 98 other senators will not be the chair of the Appropriations Committee. But there's a couple of things that we can build on. Uh, number one, a lot of what Patrick did, um, he's institutionalized. Like, for instance, the small state minimum has been really, really helpful to small states. And I'm already talking with my colleagues from small states about our advocacy for the small state minimum. And interestingly enough, Susan Collins, uh, the Republican from Maine, has been a their, her, their state has been a beneficiary of the small state minimum. So she is going to be the ranking, is the ranking member on the Appropriations Committee. Secondly, again, this is a credit to Patrick. A lot of the things he did, he got embedded into ongoing programs. Uh, Lake Champlain, for instance, you know, that's scheduled to get $35 million for cleanup in the next five years. So we're working very closely uh, with, with, with Patrick's. We have been working very closely with Patrick's staff to do everything we can uh, to continue the work that he's done. A third, you know, there's an area where Patrick was really wonderful uh, in among other places, and that was in foreign aid and the work that he did in some cases in Central America. That was in the work he did on landmines. Uh, that's the work uh, that I think has heartened Vermonters that uh, we're doing our share. And we have all the list of the things he's done, and we're going to do everything we can to continue that. So I'm not Patrick. Uh, and I'm not the chair of the Appropriations Committee, uh, but I'm persistent. I find allies who are similarly situated, and it will be Republicans and Democrats to help their small states, and we'll do every single thing we can, Rocket, uh, to make certain Vermont is taken care of and then some. Thank you. Uh, hi, Senator Welch. It's, hi, uh, I'm Joe Paris. I'm from Vermont, uh, yeah. Norwich, Vermont. Um, so you made a pretty powerful statement earlier about how these past midterm elections were kind of a referendum on, uh, you know, those who denied the election and uh, Joe Biden's appointment of president. I think another another piece of that referendum came with the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the general outrage right. that there was towards the Republican Party uh, about that and the general sentiment that it made. Uh, to women in general about right. how the federal government now wants to dictate their access to health services. No, no, the, the court. Court, sorry. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, given the fact that uh, Republicans lost majorly in these past midterm elections or didn't see the sort of red wave that they wanted to, um, do you think there's going to be any chance that Democrats are going to be able to look at some of their uh, conservative colleagues and maybe try to get them to come across the aisle a little bit when it comes towards uh, legislation regarding abortion and women's health? The, uh, uh, first of all, let's talk about the court. The court's outrageous. Okay? It's become very politicized. It's the worst court we've had since pre-Civil War. That's my view. And what they are saying in the doctrine that they used in order uh, to overturn Roe v. Wade is saying that there's no such thing as substantive due process that unless something is written in the Constitution itself, like abortion, then that's not protected. And it's up to the states. And of course, that could apply to interracial marriage. It could apply to birth control. You know, the list goes on. And that is just a retrograde majority point of view that manifests itself in the decision overturning Roe v. Wade. So that is a real problem, and it's going to take some time to solve that. I mean, I actually think 
we've got to deal with the court. And I'd like to have court. I'd like to have term limits for Supreme Court justices. And where every president would have the opportunity to appoint a couple of justices, because the terms would roll on. So there'd always be at least the capacity of the voters through their decision on who should be our president to weigh in on the kind of person that will be nominated and considered for the Supreme Court. That'll take some time, OK? But this is, this is really an attack. And it's why it's so important what we do in the states. You saw with us in Vermont, we passed the Constitutional Amendment by an overwhelming uh, majority to protect reproductive freedom for women in the state of Vermont. So the states are going to be very, very, very important in protecting those rights. So that's good for Vermont. But when I talk to Vermont women, yeah, they're really glad that we passed that constitutional amendment. But I haven't met a Vermont woman who is satisfied that her right is because of what her zip code is, as opposed to who she is. All right, so we've got work to do in the, we'll continue this in Congress. I do support term limits. Uh, but I will, I am pointing out how important it is what we do in the states to protect rights. So you, you support, yes. Um, you support abortion? It's uh, Jordan Green. I confess. Yeah, Jordan, I'm, how are you? I'm from New Good Hampshire. Um, uh, so I'll be brief. Um, given the, the setup of the new, of the new, uh, 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 how the Hill works now. Um, I, it, it seems to me that it's going to be very easy for not much to happen given the, the House and the Senate uh, control. But in terms of things that need to happen, um, whether it's, in my opinion, of funding for, the, for Ukraine or some health care reform still or the debt ceiling, do you have any thoughts on how we'll get anything proactive? Well, first of all, let me tell you. Or am you, I wrong? No, you're not wrong. We've got, uh, we've got a House. Uh, that is Republican majority, and the new rules in the House are really favoring the radical right, and there's a real question as to whether we'll get a budget or a government shutdown. There's a real question of whether we'll default on our debt or deal with the debt ceiling. Those are very live questions. But I want to put, I want to say something that's, I think, really, really important, whatever the outcome of those battles are. We've got to be effective spending and implementing the programs that we started. The Inflation Reduction Act had about $500 billion that is going to help us address climate change and presume, and according to the best calculations, bring carbon emissions down 40% below 2005, 2005 levels. That's hard work to make that work. Okay, That's really hard work to make it work. And the administration has to be focused on it. And Congress has to be focused on making certain that that money is well spent. So that's an area where implementation and effectiveness is going to be the best, at the, the, the best advertising we can do to get another shot in the next election from people who have confidence in us. The same is true with infrastructure. You know, we're going to get a couple of billion dollars in the state. And it's about broadband build out. It's about roads and bridges. It's about cleaning up our water. Well, that's hard to do. You know, it's easy. Well, it's, you have these huge battles about getting the appropriation. And it's hard. But then you get it. And then the real hard work begins. How do you make it work? And that's where people like Rocket and folks in the local communities who are on the boards of civil authority or on the boards of the select boards uh, have to do that really, really hard work. So that's something we've got to be paying attention to. The other thing we can do is we've got to really be addressing, even if we don't get there, these challenges of affordability that are really tough and making a difference in people's lives. I mean, it's really, really impossible for people to work if they've got a couple of kids and they have no affordable childcare. It's really hard uh, on a lot of our employers when their workers can't live anywhere near where the job is. And that's a housing challenge. You know, it's really, really tough when the cost of health care is going up so much. And we can talk all we want about access, but if the cost keeps going up and up, it's not going to be affordable whether the taxpayer is paying for it, whether the employer is paying for it, or whether it's coming out of your pocket. I mean, let me give an example of the ripoff. The COVID vaccine saved us many lives. 26 bucks is what it cost. 
for each one of those doses. And that was because there was an agreed upon price. So it was a price negotiation between the government and Moderna and Pfizer, 26 bucks. The government paid for it, okay? Even after the government, by the way, put up billions to build manufacturing facilities in advance of a proven vaccine so that when the vaccine came, we'd be ready to produce it. That was a time-limited deal. Pfizer and Moderna, who made billions, by the way, and God bless them, made billions, is now raising that $26 price to 130 bucks. Yes, that's right. And the cost of each one of those to manufacture is under $3. That's not right. That's just not right. And you can go through case after case, example after example in healthcare where that's allowed to happen. So your government has to play a role in protecting consumers against that kind of price gouging. So there are things that we can do and should do and keep up you know, a strong, compelling argument to stick up for everyday people who are trying to make it through life and pay their bills. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Senator Welsh. I'm Sarah Jackson with Vital Communities. We're a regional nonprofit working to- Used to be on your board. Yes, in the good I know, old days. sharing that, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm interested in um, what you have to say about this unique bi-state region that we're in. Um, many of the issues that we're working on, like housing and childcare, energy and climate, we're seeing very progressive, um, responsible policies here in Vermont and um, people shaking their heads across the, the river um, saying we're not getting much support on these issues in New Hampshire. And I just wonder, is there anything that can be done at the federal level to try to help by state regions like ours who are wanting to thrive well, and seeking solutions. I have good news for you. <laughs> Two of the best members of the United States Senate are Maggie Hassan and Jean Shaheen. <laughs> and, well, they are, and you know, uh, we, we share rural interests, and we've been talking, uh, as I have been talking with my colleague, Angus King and, and Susan Collins, uh, there are, we're looking for ways where we, where we can work together to the benefit uh, of our similar situations. Uh, you know, I can't, <laughs> I can't answer for what's going on in Concord. Uh, it won't try. But bottom line, uh, that's a really wise thing to do when there are some areas where it may really make sense for us to partner. And by the way, what you're underselling what's happening here in the in the upper valley i have seen how our employers are coming together and trying together to f help on housing and they just want people to be able to afford to live close to where they're working whether whichever side of the river they're on so you know what i it's been amazing to me my time in politics to see how employers have started to really step forward on things that they when i first got involved in politics didn't want to have anything to do with childcare housing you know, healthcare, all these things that they know their employees need. And these are employers, by and large, who really care about their employees uh, and are really becoming a political force on behalf of policies that make those things accessible. But thank you for your work. Hi there, my name is Linda Miller. I live right here in Hartford. Um, so I don't know that there's anything that's going to be done about it, but it really irks me to no end that when after, during the pandemic and we had the PPP money and, and the cheaters got in there and stole, from my point of view, billions and billions of dollars, what's going to become of that money? Are we going to get some of that back? And in that same vein, this nonsense about, well, we're going to defund the IRS because, you know, why would we need to pay our bills? Um, what, what's going to happen with that? Well, uh, of course, I totally support the prosecution of anybody who misused any governmental funds. OK, and how much we'll get. And uh, the, the, some of those folks who created false employees and got those checks, they should be prosecuted and punished. And anything we, that we can get back, we should. So I think all, all of us, I, I think, really agree with you on that. Uh, the IRS issue shows what 
the battle is. I mean, the last Congress put money into the IRS to allow them basically to get modern computers and adequate staff to be able to answer your question when you call and also uh, do audits, uh, particularly audits of very wealthy individuals who have been skating by uh, in a lot of our corporations that really don't pay much by way of taxes. And the first bill that, or first or second bill that the new House of Representatives passed was to get rid of funding for the IRS. And by most accounts, it's about $400 billion a year in unpaid taxes that comes, uh, you know, there's not many of you who pay a billion dollars a year in taxes or owe that much. <laughs> so I don't think you're getting away with anything. But bottom line, if you're gonna have a fair tax system, uh, you've got to collect what's due from the people who have the capacity to pay, but just don't before you go back to those who are struggling to pay more. So thank you. Evening, Senator Welch. Thanks for joining us here this evening. Congratulations to your election Thanks. to the Senate. Uh, in your remarks, you mentioned climate change and a couple times in your responses. And I was thinking uh, your approach, you referenced like with broadband and reaching to colleagues and hearing what's happening in their district, et cetera. And here we are in mid-January in Vermont and kind of a weak winter once again. The White River's bank full when you might expect it to be frozen this time of year. And I'm, I'm wondering if the Northeast states might align with their senators and members of Congress and develop a shared statement around what is really the loss and the erosion of the four seasons. Right. Right. And the importance aesthetically, recreationally, and economically to northern states of that. I appreciate your comments on that approach. Well, I'm for that approach, but I want more than a statement. You know, I want uh, real action that in policies uh, that can be implemented that will reduce carbon emissions so we can get our winners back. So, and, you know, the northeast region is, among the Senate, is, is united on that. So I favor that. But more than a statement, we've got to have action. And by the way, I mentioned earlier effectiveness, making things work. You know how much climate denial we've had? And it's bizarre because it's right in front of our eyes, but you had people denying that it really is happening. That wasn't so much denying the science. That was the fear of what was required to make the transition. Well, do you know an interesting, you all know Marjorie Taylor Greene? Yeah. All right. She's starting to brag about solar because in the Inflation Reduction Act, as a result of the incentives in there, and this was a piece of legislation that John Ossoff got in, all right, wonderful sen young senator from Georgia, uh, there's going to be a $2.5 billion solar panel plant built uh, outside of Atlanta, 2,500 good paying jobs, right? So that's my point about effectiveness. That's a policy that when it works and you can build on it, then the argument goes away from the bogus science denial into the bragging <laughs> by Marjorie Taylor Greene about these 2,500 jobs that are in uh, her district. So we've got to make th we've got to get things done and we've got to implement uh, and do that. Senator Yeah. Gregory Prince. Um, hey, Greg. Hi. As an historian, I'm going to ask a somewhat selfish question. Maybe you can give us a civics, a um, little bit of civics education. If you're at liberty, can you give us any insight into what took place last week when they were on the debate or on the election of the speaker in terms of what the Democrats considered and didn't do is what they might have done? Um, might they have voted for a Republican? Might they have uh, nominated Liz Cheney or done any? I mean, was, I would be interested in if you, if I know you're not in the House any longer, could give us some insight into what was transpiring both on the Democratic, we know what was happening on the Republican side. Well, I, I but you what know, the Democrats were thinking. Gregory, uh, I was watching, like you, uh, kind of amazed. And what was happening is, you know, traditionally the, the, the majority party is going to have the speaker. And what happened was that there was a stick up uh, by the very radical element of the Republican Party that was in a position to block any election unless the candidate, in this case Kevin McCarthy, capitulated to their demands. Uh, and they made demands and they won. And I think it's gonna, it, it really bodes uh, very dangerously for what lies ahead. 
in these big issue things. What the Democrats could have done, I mean, you're saying, and there was discussion about this, that they get behind what I would call a governing Republican. You know, there's a lot of really good Republicans uh, that I've worked with here in Vermont and are, I've worked with in Congress. You know, they, they, they may have different points of view about taxing and spending and how fast to do this or how slow to do that, but they believe in democracy. They believe in compromise. They believe in governing, and they believe that we all have a duty as representatives to try to make progress and not just make uh, academic points. So there was some theoretical possibility that the Democrats would get behind a what I'll call a governing Republican. But I wasn't in, in the conversations about how that would happen. It, and uh, I would have loved to watch that, though. I, I'm with you on that, Gregory. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Peter. Hi. It's Corlin hi. Johnson. Yeah, Corlin. Hi. Um, Good to see you. So my, the short version of my question is, we are in White River Junction. Is there any possibility of our, your getting money for the train system in this country? <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, I mean, we did get some money for trains, but we, we need a lot of money for trains, and we need to make a commitment to the benefit of that policy. We have a lot of challenges in the Northeast, uh, and improving the train bed, uh, the train tracks is expensive and difficult. Rights away are really difficult, but it's a worthy effort. And as you know, uh, the so-called high-speed train, you know, in the western part of the state uh, is higher than it was but it's not high speed like people in, it wouldn't be recognizable to people in Europe, okay? <laughs> um, so the, the battle continues. That's something I've been involved with uh, since I was on the Transportation Committee uh, in, the, in the State Senate. Uh, so thank you for the reminder to keep at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, Peter. I'd, I'd like to, first of all, I go to the Norwich Town. And I see my senator <laughs> dumping his trash right next to me in a t-shirt and jeans. And I'm really proud that you're our senator. <laughs> you know, I, it, I can't stay away from the dump. You know, my, my first campaign, I'm interrupted and telling the stories. Uh, but you know how people do door-to-door -door campaigns? I did a dump-to-dump -dump campaign. And those were in the good old days when Chandler Hewitt from Pomfret was over here at the Hartford Dump. And, uh, and it was, you know, you brought your stuff in and threw it in the burn pile. I mean, I can't say that now. I mean, I didn't do it. <laughs> but he had a 22 down there and he used to shoot the rats. It was just uh... <laughs> uh, Could you teach us how, it, it seems too coincidental that of the 500 people in Congress, they almost always vote for their party's legislation and not the other parties. I can't imagine that each group is so monolithic in their thinking that they, they don't think, oh, that idea is a bad one. I'm not going to vote for it. All of our ideas are good ones. Is there, does the party system threaten the individual people? Are there incentives in place? How is it that people seem to vote the party line so often? You know, it, it's worse in the House than in the Senate. And there's two things about that. There's been a real breakdown in the committee process in the House, and to some extent in the Senate. You know, in pre, I'll, I'll date it with Newt Gingrich. Uh, committees had a lot of authority. And if legislation was going to be considered, it had to go through the committee. And a lot of the challenges had to be worked out. And this is how it was, Anne, when we were in the State House, and still is, I think, there. So there'd be a lot of pushing and shoving debate about what to do. But when something came out of a committee, it oftentimes had bipartisan support. That gave it a real shot on the floor. The combination of, in Congress, the concentration of power in the Speaker's office and, to some extent, in the leadership in the Senate has eroded the committees. But that's a real reflection of how tribal our politics have become in the country. Mm -hmm. right. So what happens now is that you do work, your, you work in the committee, but ultimately a lot more of the final product comes out of the speaker's office. And whether it's a Republican or Democrat, it tends to get loaded up with things that make it impossible for the other side to vote. The second thing is the tribal area of politics. Do you remember 
after President Obama got elected, one of the things Mitch McConnell said was that he regarded his job was to make him a one-term president. That reflects it's all about combat as opposed to about policy. You know, in Vermont, we get it. You have the fight in the election, and then whoever wins, we have a mutual responsibility, Republicans and Democrats, to now use our position to make progress for Vermonters. That's what we have to do. Well, that's kind of faded away in DC, and much to my dismay. Just a little bit. Could you teach us what would happen to a Democrat in the House if they voted for a Republican bill? You know, nothing really would happen. You know, I voted for Republican bills, and I work, I work with them. But it, it's not that. It's not that there's what, what, what it is. I'll give an example, a very concrete example. I've been working really hard on prescription drugs, OK? There's two areas. There's patent abuse, where there tends to be bipartisan support. And then there's price negotiation, where the Republicans are really against it in the House. And I'm really, really for it, OK? We had an we passed patent reform out of our committee with bipartisan support. But before that went to the floor, the question was, should we put patent reform into our price negotiation bill? My position was no, we shouldn't. Let's do them separately, because it'll be really good if we can get a bipartisan vote on something I think is good, they think is good, and not make them vote on something they think is bad, which is separate. I lost that debate. So the two things got merged together, and it was a party line vote because the Republicans were against negotiation. I totally disagree with them on that. But they, were able, they would have gone with us on the patent reform. So my approach on that, let's do what we can together. You don't agree with us on this other thing. I think strongly it's important to do it. I'll do it, and you vote no, and we'll have that debate about who's right in the election. Peter. Yeah. Hi. Joe. Yeah. Hi, John. Hi. Um, I just want to ask a question. You mentioned before about all these, there's some governing Republicans. So I just want to ask about that. Um, I'm trying to figure out how, how is it possible that nobody can speak out against whatever is holding them back? Is there some threat against their life, their children, their families? It is incredible that there is no, and it could also be marketing and how we have the news just only promotes what it wants to promote, which is another issue. We should be putting some good news out there. I mean, it's stressful yeah. listening to everything awful that's going on. But also, there doesn't seem to be a single voice of independent thought with the Republicans. It's like a en masse kind of conversation. I'm just wondering, how is that ever going to be broken? Well, you know, it, the fever may be broke, breaking now. You know, Trump had an iron grip on the Republican Party. My view, he, he destroyed the Republican Party a lot of us have admired over the years. You know, small government, personal responsibility, lower taxes. And that personal responsibility often included not just your own behavior, but your commitment to building a local bank or being on the volunteer fire department. And Trump obviously made the party all about himself. And it was really tough for a lot of my Republican colleagues because they, in fact, got voted out when they crossed Trump. They paid a real price. Uh, let's hope that's starting to change. We need two good parties. We need two good principled parties. Thank you. A couple more questions. Um, and, hey, yeah. Senator Thank Welch. You. Um, my name is Justina. Um, and uh, I'm right. part of a group of folks from my area um, in the Bradford Fairley sort of area and the Orford Piermont, New Hampshire area, as mentioned before, because we're such a both sides of the river community um, who are really working on food access for our neighbors. And I am really disappointed to see that the extra COVID related SNAP benefits are going to be ending. Um, and I think it's going to have a really big impact in our community. And I would love to just hear um, your thoughts on how to sort of help with uh, food security in our communities um, as <clears throat> on the ground in our communities. We're trying to do as much as we can to support right. our neighbors, but um, food prices have gone up for all of us. So right. thank you. Well, thank you for your work. And food security is insecurity is huge. Uh, you know, COVID showed how important it was 
uh, to put money into that, and our schools did an incredible job. You all know this, but our schools, when the kids weren't even coming in, the school buses were driving around the route delivering meals to the families. No, it's amazing. And I was just up in St. Albans uh, at their school, and they've really created this farm-to-table program. Uh, they've got kids uh, 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 in, in, in nutrition classes. They've actually been serving four meals. I mean, that includes snacks. Um, and all the teachers I spoke to said it's enormously beneficial for the, for the kids. And it's for all the kids. So you don't have to show that you're really poor and are going to be treated differently than your classmates. So that's really a good investment. And the farm bill's coming up. So there's going to be a battle about what the funding is uh, for these nutrition programs and food security programs. And I'll be working with uh, my colleague from the House, Jim McGovern, to do everything we can to make those as strong as possible. But thank you for the good work you're doing. Peter, my, my name is Carl Bielenberg, and I just have a question about Ukraine. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm wondering whether Ukraine is already receiving some humanitarian assistance from the United States. Um, and I'm asking it because I've, I've not seen anything in the news about that. I've seen that there was funds allocated for that, but is that to be triggered like when the war is over? or? It seems to me they should be getting humanitarian assistance now. Uh, there's been about $113 billion uh, for military, uh, and that does include a, a smaller amount of that for humanitarian. Uh, and obviously the rebuilding, not just rebuilding, but their survival, getting through the winter, uh, and, and, and talk about food insecurity, all of those just day-to-day -day living challenges that so many uh, folks in Ukraine are facing. We do need to uh, supplement uh, the military aid with humanitarian aid. And they're getting some, but I'm sure it's not enough. But I think that's we, uh, the last question. Yeah. I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank uh, you. So Peter, or Senator. Peter's, uh, I Peter get works. Back, uh, I want to get back to what the woman over there very, very eloquently brought up about our veterans um, being homeless and uh, and also the high suicide rate, right? Uh, it's it's a really simple formula. To, if uh, if I can share that with you, I am a veteran, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I am facing eviction, and there is not one single Vermont agency that will help. I have an excellent caseworker through Bernie Sanders' office, um, and she tries, <laughs> but it's, it's futile. Uh, it, the, the Vermont Housing Authority, no. Uh, Veterans ain't, no. All they want to do is yank you out of where you are. They don't want to help you. They want to put you in some place. Um, there's uh, shadow subsidies. No, they don't help. Sevka doesn't help. Right. So you talk about suicide. I work seven days a week so that I don't get thrown out of my mm. home. Mm -hmm. All right. I also travel to my major job as a school bus driver over an hour one way. Wow. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is a cycle of you work, you eat, you sleep. And then the veteran looks around and says, well, gee, what's this worth? I've thought about suicide, mm -hmm. right? And I will never, ever tell anyone whether I will commit suicide or not because <laughs> when I suggested it, the Hartford police came to my home, forced me to my knees, handcuffed me behind my back, dragged me to the cruiser. Okay. And that left me with post-traumatic, I mean, I had nightmares, mm -hmm. still do, about that. So, um, it, what, you know, it has to fix, the, the agencies in Vermont have to be fixed so that they help the poor. Mm -hmm. They're not doing that. They're not even set up to do that. I went through the whole mill. 
before VRAP was done. I was on that, and of course, you know what happened with that. That's gone. So what do you do? When, can, when are our legislators going to fix the broken system so that the poor people can survive? I can't even get three squares. Not, not eligible. Well, it's pretty discouraging to hear. Uh, and I don't have an answer on how that will be fixed. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'd be glad to talk with uh, you and, and Bernie and his caseworker to see about the particulars of uh, your situation. I mean, we, you know, we do a lot of casework. It's really one of the joys of our job to be able to do that. And uh, what you're describing sounds like a nightmare. Well, it's compounded because um, I'm also a traditional Native American. Mm -hmm. And the Vermont House does not recognize us as a people. So if they don't recognize us as a people, we're invisible. We're the invisible nation. Yeah. And you, so, yes, I, my caseworker, Bernie Sanders, was working with me for two, over two years. Wonderful person. But her hands are tied. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. Well, thank you all. We're, are we entered? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.